I'm just going to talk about a fairly <laughs> surgical sort of approach really. I think we've had some beautiful uh, run through about the general pathology we're dealing with and I think the surgical approach to it is something which has been a little undercooked for a long time. Um, the tricuspid valve is a, is a much more complex structure in many ways than the mitral. The, um, if you think about the cross section of the right ventricle where it's a sort of crescentic shape and the right ventricle is wrapped around the left ventricle so the inflow is separated by quite a significant distance from the outflow and instead of having two fairly parallel papillary muscles you've got the septal attachment to the papillary muscles as well. You've got three rather than two leaflet complexes and the varying degrees of fixation to the septum. Um, so overall there's a lot more variation anatomically in the tricuspid valve just in the normal valve than there is in the mitral. So that surgically it represents an interesting challenge in many ways. Um, the broad sort of tricuspid structural description is really a gross oversimplification. I mean we have an anterior leaflet, there's three commissures and there's a commissural leaflet complex at each one and there's a variability in the structure, particularly the anterior leaflet often isn't all that big and sail like, it's often got a big cleft right in the middle of it here and I think that there's a, a subset of tricuspid valves that don't respond very well to annular dilatation so they lose their coaptation early and they leak a lot more than you would expect for the degree of annular dilatation they get. When annular dilatation does occur it's very asymmetrical. So the posterior leaflet gets, can increase in size. The posterior leaflet is the part that dilates by far the most. The anterior leaflet about half as much and the septal leaflet barely enlarges at all because it's fixed to the septum. So if you look at this area, this is a typical tricuspid annulus, so the central fibrous body would be here, coronary sinus is down here. As the surgeon looks at it, this will be the anterior leaflet. And it doesn't, it doesn't take nearly as much of the dilatation as the posterior half of the valve. And the septal leaflet along here doesn't have any dilatation virtually at all. So that when you're trying to repair the valve, whether it's for functional uh, annuloplasty or for more complex structural disease, this very asymmetrical pattern of annular dilatation needs to be taken into account. Here we have the coronary sinus, central fibrous body, septal leaflet, anterior and the way it stretches out, the septal virtually not at all, anterior a bit and the posterior the most. It's also a three dimensional structure as is the mitral with a distinct uh, bend in down towards the septal leaflet which is reflected in the types of devices we use to repair it so that a typical modern tricuspid annuloplasty device is quite a three-dimensional structure and that allows us to remodel the annulus in a way that will be functionally more useful. The old-fashioned surgical way of repairing this which reminds me a lot of these interventional approaches is the so-called the devagar annuloplasty which boils down to a purse string around the valve and in the old days and probably in some centres still, I've certainly seen it talked about by many uh, particularly older surgeons but basically with a beating heart and the heart open you put a double pledgeted stitch around the annulus missing the tri you hope you missed the conducting system in here so septal anterior posterior and you just scrunch it up until the tricuspid valve looks alright um, and that will definitely reduce the regurgitation in many cases but the the problem is that these sutures tend to tear out and the whole thing falls to bits in a few months. There's a variety of issues with it that didn't work terribly well and this prompted the development of more modern annuloplasty devices. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the surgery because that particular approach with the beating heart, sort of moving target blood everywhere thing for the surgeon at the end of a mitral valve operation when you're worried about the cross clamp time I think is a not a good way to deal with the tricuspid valve. It's a, it's a delicate structure. Uh, I've certainly seen cases where it's been torn to shreds by people trying to operate it when it's moving. Uh, the leaflets are much thinner and much more delicate than the, the mitral. So my view of it is that at surgery you want to have a, a good view of the valve. You've got to see the whole valve at once. You use bypass and if you cross clamp the pulmonary artery as well as the, as the aorta you can then, you have the heart stopped but you can test the valve by instilling saline into the ventricle, the leaflets um, close and coapt as they will and you can determine exactly what the anatomical problem with it is. 
these are just surgical issues to re related to how you get to see it. Um, there aren't very many good retractors for the tricuspid, so we use a bunch of stay stitches, and that holds quite well. In the repair technique, the the sutures, um, the approach should be, I think, related to first, if you're simply repairing the valve uh, for annuloplasty, then you've got to distribute the sutures in such a way that you submit you asymmetrically reduce the annulus to reflect the way the annulus has dilated. So you get maximum reduction in the region of the posterior leaflet and much less reduction in the region of the anterior leaflet and no reduction in the region of the septal leaflet. And that will give you the best combination of leaflets covering the, the whole orifice um, but still getting a good sized opening. The saline test instilling saline in with the pulmonary artery clamp is very helpful. And this just illustrates a tricuspid valve with the annuloplasty ring already in position with the heart open. And you squirt saline into the ventricle with the pulmonary artery clamped and the leaflets trip quite nicely. And this approach can be used when you're trying to identify parts of leaflet that are prolapsing, that have ruptured segments, deficiency. And if you put the annuloplasty sutures in before, you can adjust the shape of the annuloplasty. This is a standard anatomical annuloplasty. You can also, some of these valves end up better if they're round, so you can use a, a uh, non-rigid non annuloplasty device for them. And it has to be individualised. I think the message, my experience with it, particularly having a sort of cross of congenital disease, is that they're all a bit different. You've got to play with it a bit, much more than with the mitral, which is, has relatively straightforward anatomy by comparison. The anterior leaflet's commonly <coughs> cleft in the um, in one of the sort of common anatomical variants. So there's really a, a two-part anterior leaflet complex rather than single. And I think this certainly are the ones we see with severe, completely isolated tricuspid regurgitation. That seems to be the commonest anatomical variant. The anteroceptal commissure <coughs> is the part that's most commonly affected by endocarditis. In the congenital group, if you have a small perimembranous ventricular septal defect, that's where it goes and the jet lesion causes endocarditis that destroys the septal leaflet completely. Um, sometimes you've got to use sutures to, Gore-Tex sutures to replace the, the uh, cordy as well. So this is the cleft anterior leaflet, so you've got the two-part anterior leaflet. And here we just we use an autologous pericardial patch to augment the leaflet annual plastic device to support it because there's always secondary annual dilatation and you end up with quite a good result repairing the valve. And this can be added even to a standard annual plastic if you don't get a terribly good result. It's often because of this anatomical variant in a patient who's got secondary tricuspid regurgitation from mitral disease. In the more complex one where we've had endocarditis, this just represents a, a VSD repair. It's an illustration from a patient I did years ago, but he had he was 35 years old. He had a liver that was pulsatile and down in his pelvis. He had a atrial fibrillation and really severe right heart failure. And we thought we'd have a look at uh, trying to do a maze type operation for his atrial fibrillation and do something for a 35 year old that didn't involve a bioprosthesis. And what, we came, what I came up with was he actually, he'd had a previous tricuspid valve surgery You'd had the whole anterior leaflet, or sorry, half the anterior leaflet roughly, or probably a third of it removed, and the whole of the septal leaflet. But he had quite a lot of good anterior and posterior leaflet area left, which was well supported in this probably 50 millimetre annulus. And when you looked at it all, you could join the, make, create a new commissure for him out here um, and give him a bicuspidized valve so that half the end or two thirds of the anterior leaflet and the whole of the posterior leaflet complex was used. And then we patched, so I just put an autologous pericardial patch where the septal leaflet would be. So effectively reduced the orifice substantially. And this valve worked pretty much physiologically. Did a maze operation for his atrial fibrillation and he's back in the game with a situation which otherwise would have been rolling towards a heart transplant. You could have also put a bioprosthesis in one of the things that I've discovered with the congenital work is we have these patients who have varying degrees of hypoplasia of the right ventricle, and with that goes a tricuspid valve that's progressively smaller in proportion. You actually don't need anything like the standard valve area to get by 
very effectively. You can have normal hemodynamics with at least half the area and probably um, two thirds is quite comfortable. So you don't have to make the valve necessarily full size uh, if you're repairing for endocarditis. The main thing is to use supported normal valve tissue as much as possible. Anything you do with patches, sutures, any kind of device that does anything ends up as a block of calcified leaflet tissue that shrivels and shrinks and fails with time. So the answer is maximise the use of the patient's own tissue where possible. We've talked about, and I think this is probably a much broader audience than surgical, but the surgical group I think has to think more seriously about it in terms of the asymmetrical reduction to get the best possible outcome. I think it's worth spending a little time with the heart stopped to get a really good look at it and to try and get a better result than just uh, sort of scrunch it up at the end of your mitral valve procedure. There's a number of, there's all sorts of technical manoeuvres that you can do to selectively reduce the annulus in a way that optimises leaflet coaptation but maximises leaflet area and that's the goal of any valve repair whether it's tricuspid or mitral. Just to reinforce that point. You've got to avoid the conducting system with the um, tricuspid valve. In broad terms, the right fibrous trigone or central fibrous body, which is roughly corresponds to the anteroceptal commissure, is a strong place that you can put stitches into because it's not part of the conducting system. The his bundle is immediately behind it. If you avoid the upper half of the triangle of cock and the um, right ventricular side of the anteroceptal commissure, you can stay away from the, from the conducting system. It doesn't help you a lot when you've got a situation where you've got the, um, the septal leaflets gone completely because you've got to have something to attach things to if you're doing a valve replacement particularly. So if for replacement and there's no septal leaflet tissue, I incorporate the triangle of cock inside the right ventricle, um, leaving the coronary sinus on the right atrial side. And you use a bioprosthesis and just supplement it with a patch so that you use the patch to cover over the area of the, of the um, triangle of cock. You can do fine adjustments using that saline test approach in the stopped heart. The ink test is a surgical thing where we look at leaflet coaptation. If you use an ordinary skin marker with the leaflets tripped as, as illustrated in those previous pictures, uh, it shows you how far the leaflets coapt you know, by staining them. And it gives you a good idea whether you've got good leaflet coaptation when you're looking for the optimal repair. Bidirectional superior cavopulmonary shunts very effective if you have severe isolated right ventricular function. Um, I've mainly used that in congenital cases rather than acquired disease, although some of the congenital cases have been Epstein's and some of them have been people with various odd right ventricular dysplasias where if you give them a competent tricuspid valve, the right ventricle still can't cut it. And they have surprisingly good, almost probably low range normal exercise tolerance if you actually test them. Even though their superior vena cava is connected directly to the pulmonary arteries. This is just to make the point about the re replacement technique. If endocarditis has destroyed the septal leaflet, then we bring our suture line down, incorporating the atrioventricular node, and then the, the suture or the patch goes across the tendon of Tadaro which you no doubt recall connects the central fibrous body to the uh, Thebesian valve and then up in, leave the coronary sinus on the right atrium but incorporate the whole triangle of cock in the right ventricle and that will give you a, a heart block free tricuspid valve replacement. So the toolkit for tricuspid valve repair is much the same as the toolkit for mitral valve repair. You've got to do a bit of everything to make them work particularly in the isolated group where the primary operation is to repair their tricuspid valve, which is a very rare group in my experience. And I think in the worldwide literature, when we tried to write it up, we couldn't find terribly many articles about it. Most of them ended up with the sorts of 20 to 30% mortality that previous speakers have described. But uh, if you get them early before they get too bad problems, they actually do very well. I'll just briefly talk about that later. One of the hidden things with tricuspid valve disease that we see in the congenital group, and I've seen in acquired ones too, is cirrhosis of the liver. It's rarely looked for by cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, but if you have chronic severe tricuspid regurgitation, one day somebody will notice that your liver is a shrunken thing full of nod nodules, and if you're 35 or 40 years old, that's a very, very bad thing. 
because you get hepatocellular carcinoma. And I've seen that in this setting too. So we can use all these methods to make you a new, fix your valve up as much as we can. Vegetectomies and reconstruction, I think, is the big issue. The old story that you can get by without a tricuspid valve, but I can tell you that my two-year-old that I replaced, it, I removed the tricuspid valve on for um, pneumococcal endocarditis, where there was literally no valve left, not a single skerrick of leaflet tissue. Uh, lasted about 18 months before his liver hit his pelvis and he had severe symptoms of right heart failure and we've been putting bioprosthesis in him ever since. And it's, it's a difficult group. The main thing is you've got to take your time. It's very unfamiliar territory compared with the mitral and for surgeons you just it's worth getting a good result because it's the same with the mitral valve repair as a tricuspid valve repair. If it doesn't work at the operation, it sure as hell won't work long term. You must get it closer to correct. So this is our functionally good saline test with the leaflet coaptation, good zone of apposition, working nicely. There are very few studies in the literature about isolated tricuspid valve repair in the absence of, of um, of mitral valve or other secondary causes, but we've got a few patients over the years who were not Epstein's, they weren't um, functional tricuspid regurgitation of any kind, which operated on just 15 patients over many years, 16 to 76 years of age. Three of them had previous endocarditis. Uh, one had had previous surgery for endocarditis. Three of them had active endocarditis. Congenital anomalies of the tricuspid valve, which weren't characterised as Epstein's. And a couple of them had had catheter procedures where the catheter device had been caught in the valve, and um, after much manipulation, the valve had ended up substantially de functioned. Usually, if you catch enough of the valve in something like a, a pulmonary valve replacement setup, you'll end up with a seriously damaged tricuspid valve. Some of them were in quite significant heart failure with NMIHA type 3. A, few, a lot of them had atrial fibrillation. And in this context, it's right atrial origin atrial fibrillation, which is pretty unusual. This is mainly just to show the various methods of treatment, annuloplasty, patches, closure of the anterior cleft, bicuspidization, plication. The main message here is that you've got to do a lot to some of them. You've got to do a ring. You've got to fix the uh, various other things in order to get a good result. So you've got to take out the veggies, you've got to replace bits of leaflet missing, you've got to resupport the cords. You can't just do an annual plastic and hope for the best. In our group of that small group, we had no mortality. Uh, one patient had sinus node dysfunction and required a pacemaker. One of them got AF for the first time. So in summary, it's an uncommon requirement to true primary tricuspid valve repair. Uh, if you use multiple techniques, you can generally make a valve that works close to normal. And if you do it before they're in terminal heart failure or have cirrhosis, then you'll get a good clinical result. And I think that early referral in selected cases is very beneficial functionally. They sort of bumble along, not too bad, but not really right either. And uh, it's good to get them early and get them fixed. Thank you.